Hello, you guys. Welcome to the Inner Grove podcast. I'm your host, Carolina. I hope you're doing amazing. Hope you're having a beautiful day. And I am so excited because I am in Austin, Texas today, and I am recording in real life with one of my amazing friends, April. So welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yay. Can you do a brief introduction on yourself to anyone listening who doesn't follow you? I'm April Whitney. I am the founder of Petite Power, which is a company that helps short women, 504 and under, achieve a body recomp, so lose fat, build muscle, gain strength and we work on fitness nutrition and mindset just for our little short girl gang community as a short girl i appreciate (laughs) everything you do so much as you know and april has helped me so much with my own relationship with my body and just learning about being a petite woman so i love that and you're an aries queen as we know this is april's second time on the show so i will link our first episode in the description but on today's conversation we're gonna dive into radical honesty and how being super real with yourself is one of the most important things you can do to activate real change and just better wellness honestly especially mindset wise and in your relationships and we're also going to talk a little bit about improving your relationship with food and how to learn to stop overeating and respect your fullness levels and how to properly nourish yourself based on that more mindful self-aware position so yeah i'm so excited and to start off i think diving into our relationship with food is something that interests a lot of my community so i'm curious to hear on your opinion on different ways that we can start cultivating a better relationship relationship with food and just some overarching things that you feel tend to be common pain points for the people you work with. Sure. I think it's so individual. So we have to start with just where it begins for us, where we feel like we're struggling and not really think about other people's struggles, what we see on social media, the internet, what is normal doesn't really exist. Obviously there's optimized, there's healthier, but it's kind of like what's healthy for you. And that's something that makes health more murky, right? Because we have to figure it out for ourselves with the help of others. But it might look very different from what someone else is struggling with and the solution might look very different as well. So um, I think looking inward and figuring out where am I uncomfortable in my life with as it pertains to food, if anywhere, usually it's pretty obvious for us, right? If it has to do around certain foods, triggers, certain instances like eating out versus eating at home, cooking, maybe it's cultural related, like your parents eat a certain way. And yeah, there's external, there's internal, but yeah, there's so many things. (laughs) But I think just starting with defining it as where is it happening in your life and how is it making you feel is the beginning point. I agree. And I think this is such a beautiful point that goes under talked about, which is figuring out where you're at and what's missing in your relationship with food. And I've talked very openly about my relationship with food. And I feel like something I'm personally learning a lot about now and have been over the last like few years. And something I talk a lot about with my clients also is how do you understand your hunger levels and your fullness levels? And how do you understand portion size and like not going overboard where you feel so full like uncomfortably full and then you're like oh I overate and now I feel so bad and then it takes you down this like negative self-talk and also not feeling energized because you're too full so how would you recommend to anyone listening who may be struggling with understanding that for themselves how would you recommend going about that and like understanding that better for anyone who didn't watch our first episode also I'm a certified nutritionist and personal trainer so that's where my kind of background is in this I don't really Mm -hmm. believe in intuitive eating without education but there's something called the hunger fullness scale and I use this as a beginning tool with every client I work with and it's a scale one to ten. One is starving and ten is stuffed. Ten is like after Thanksgiving dinner when you are like busting out you're like the top one's coming out and like you've gotten several helpings and one is obviously like you haven't eaten in like a day you're so hungry and ravenous so depending on your goal you might want to be in a different place in the scale but generally just for maintenance for body recomposition for feeling fueled energized having enough energy to build muscle and have brain power at your job I recommend being around a six to a seven after a meal so that means you're not stuffed but you're not hungry still but it's like finding that sweet spot of where do I feel like I could still eat some, but I don't need it. I'm satisfied. I'm satiated. I feel like I have enough energy to last me at least four hours. Like you should be able to eat a meal and have a full three and a half, four hours where you're like energized and you get hungry towards the end of that. But you know, a solid amount of time, you shouldn't be like feeling like you need to snack immediately after a meal. It wasn't enough food most likely, or it wasn't the right combinations of food, not enough protein, not enough healthy fats, for example. And if someone is going for more of a weight loss or whatever, maybe it might go down. It might be a six 
of 5.5. It depends. Also, that really, really depends on how many calories they're taking in to begin with, because not everyone should be restricting calories as a means of losing weight. There's other ways to create a calorie deficit than taking away food, which you should go for first before the calorie deficit always. But yeah, I would say using that scale, you can start to develop a relationship with that by just checking in with your body after meals and say, okay, I just had a meal. Honestly, where am I at on a scale of one to 10? Rate it. And if you're like a nine or eight and you feel uncomfortable and stuff, do you know, okay, I need to stop eating sooner next time or chew my food longer or change the environment. Maybe I was eating dinner in front of the TV. Start to switch it up. But being around like a 6.5 is a really good place to be where you're like optimized. Yeah. And I love that. But I also feel like when I think of that, I'm like, okay, from a scale of one to 10, how full am I? It would be easy for me to, after a meal, be like, okay, I'm at a eight or something like that. But what do you think are reasons why people might go to that extreme and then be like, okay, I definitely ate more than my body needed? As you mentioned, for example, like watching TV while you're eating or eating too fast. What are some other things people do that might be causing them to feel that like uncomfortable feeling after eating? Yeah, I think the most common is actually emotional, emotionally related. So we use food in society today more as like a numbing like it it's putting something in your mouth it's busying your body and your mind to keep you from thinking or doing other things that you probably should be doing or you should be processing or thinking about usually it's a numbing thing if we're overeating chronically and it depends if you're like ready to look and under the hood you know check it out sometimes we're not ready for that but if we are it's kind of like okay why am i mindlessly eating right now why do i just automatically put food in my mouth and it starts with just asking the question like am i hungry and if it's a no and you're still eating that's a sign that maybe Maybe there's something we need to look at. Other things are actually just a habit loop. And there's a really great book. I can't remember if we talked about it last time called uh, Brain Over Binge. And it, it compares food to like chronic overeating to alcoholism. So the addiction of food and if you're if you really have like gone down the emotional route and this was my journey i was like i've solved the things that i feel like are emotionally related but i'm still craving food even though i'm not hungry for me it was i had created a habit like a really bad habit of just wanting to eat until it was full like too full and so looking at it also as an addiction or just an automatic behavior that you have practiced for a very long time and now it's just what you do without thinking it can also be something more mechanical like that it can be triggered by environmental factors the tv whatever time of day certain types Types of food and then the last thing is it could be nutritionally related so if you're eating really imbalanced meals they don't have a good balance of protein fat and fiber you probably are going to be hungry later so it's also just like educationally like are you getting the right balance of macronutrients in your meals and micronutrients too yeah i think all of that is so important and just kind of putting myself on the spot what i know usually causes me to feel a little bit disconnected is eating meals alone and then wanting to distract myself like scroll listen to a podcast watch tv and that's a habit i'm really trying to break but it's super hard and again as you said it's an automatic thing that you go for it's like okay i'm eating by myself i'm home alone i'm working from home let me just pick up my phone and scroll while i eat so i think breaking that habit can be really hard but i also think two other things for me have affected this in my life and one of them is time of day is being like okay it's 1 p.m i should go eat or like i'm on vacation i don't know next time i'm gonna be able to eat like let me go and like eat now even though i'm not like that hungry yet and then i feel too full so time of day sometimes like messes with me a little bit and then I think just growing up with parents that were very much about like finish your plate I think it creates this belief system where it's like if you don't finish your plate it's bad yeah so one of the questions I ask my clients if this is something that comes up is just evaluate the belief systems your parents gave you about food what do you believe is true about food based on growing up in a household with them or without them or you know whatever your growing up situation was what beliefs were given to you that you didn't actually create yourself about food food and what are your memories early on about food all that stuff can really help kind of piece together like a healthier dynamic with food and relationship in general too yeah for sure let's use me as an example with what i just shared with like the beliefs i grew up this is a great way i think to start right like examine okay if i have these beliefs about food like i have to finish it might not even be like a belief you're aware of it might be so subconscious mm -hmm. but then you would just do it because it's something that you grew up doing or that you've always done so i think a big part of that is just realizing there are certain things you're just doing on autopilot and breaking them is going to require extra effort. But when it comes to the time of day aspect, how would you recommend navigating that and learning to like tune in a little bit better instead of relying on like, maybe I'll be hungry later. So let me eat more now or something like that. It's funny because some of my clients have the opposite problem. 
So it's interesting how it's like another testament mm. to how different people are with food. Wait, what do you mean? Meaning they are so erratic with food timing. They don't eat at regular intervals and then they skip a meal and now they're like so hungry by dinner. They're eating, you know, three meals in one sitting. But it, it sounds like you have regular times where you're like, I should eat even if you're not hungry. Yes. Okay. So I think that there's a fun experiment you could do where you're just like, today I'm not even going to eat according to the clock. I'm going to throw that out the window and just see how it goes. And I'm going to write down when I get hungry and eat when I get hungry and kind of just see what happens see where your natural windows are you have to treat relationships with your food like experiments and not like one day is not going to mess anything up or change anything or affect your entire global relationship with food from your whole life right so it's kind of like what can you learn from just changing your perspective that day maybe wake up and just commit to a day of eating only when you're hungry and then you might find oh I'm actually hungry just two hours after all the windows I've been eating it's not that far from my normal, you know, feeding hours. And then, you know, maybe you say, okay, I don't have to eat at one, but I eat between one and three and I eat between like four and seven. And then now you have windows instead of like distinct times. Yeah, exactly. Like sometimes I'll be hungry for dinner already at like 4.30 or like I'll be hungry for a meal at 4.30 and then I'll eat. Like let's say I have a snack and it's a pretty feeling snack. Then like by dinner time, I'm not that hungry. But then I'm like, wait, I should have a dinner. And then I don't know. It's just like learning to kind of throw those things out. And I think I've been questioning that a lot recently and over the last few months and just trying to tune in a little bit better and I think it comes down so much to the beliefs that you have as we've been talking about and just realizing that the way you've always done something doesn't necessarily mean is the way you should keep doing it or I love what you said about treating it as an experiment as mm-hmm. well and there's not really any shoulds yeah there are some guidelines there's helpful things but you don't have to eat a certain hour and i would also say you look back at the meal you had before you're like say you're hungry around four what did you eat earlier that day like did you set yourself up for success or did you kind of graze all day like usually we can learn a lot from our sleep and then also like what happened a few hours ago or the day before did we drink more alcohol because our blood sugar changes throughout the day based on what we ate so it also could just be if you're not eating full meals meals regularly it will start to play with your appetite and things could get a little off schedule too yeah and i think something that's under talked about is the impact of sleep on appetite so i already know a little bit about this but can you dive into that and like how leptin and ghrelin can be affected by sleep yeah i'm no by no means a hormones expert but when i was training for the olympics sleep was the top priority before almost everything else even training and nutrition honestly it was like you need nine to ten hours as an athlete this was like you know top i didn't get that but (laughs) i was aiming for like eight sleep is the most important thing for regulating every process in the body and there's so many studies that show how sleep is very correlated to your ability to lose fat your metabolism which is just your ability to make use of calories and make them energy or store them as fat basically so leptin and ghrelin these hunger hormones they they have to do with your uh, satiety, your hunger, if you actually feel full after you eat a meal and how hungry you will be later after eating a meal. And they're very complicated. So again, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert, but your sleep impacts your hormones, your secretion of those hormones, timing, and also things like alcohol and sugars do impact it as well. So if you're like getting only a few hours of sleep, there's a lot of studies that, as you know, that show you're going to be hungrier the next day. Your levels of hormones will change based on your sleep. So it does affect everything. And Rather than try to fight it the next day, I'd say just eat according to your, your hunger hormones that day and then just get back on track the next day. We, we yeah. often really get in a trap because we're trying to constantly overcorrect something and you can't do it that way. You have to just be like, okay, I'm just going to do what I can with today, make the best choices I can. It's not going to be perfect. I'm going to be hungrier. Then go to bed at a good time and like get up the next day and make better choices. So it's like not about overcorrecting. It's just getting back on track the next day, you know? I think that's amazing that you mentioned that because I also feel the same applies to when you're understanding your body even if you're not like sleep deprived on that day when it comes to for example that scale of like zero to ten like how hungry or how full you feel after a meal or if you overeat in a certain day or in a certain meal or if you eat more in a whole day the next day just being like okay it's just a new day like let Mm -hmm. me just go back to a baseline and i feel like that's something that perfectionists and a lot of listeners struggle with which is that zero or 100 mindset right it's like you go overboard then you have to go like on the opposite extreme completely to quote unquote overcorrect as you said Mm -hmm. that's why i love ranges 
balance. Like in everything, we're never going to be perfect. We're not perfect beings. So it's like, what's your windows for success? Like open up the range of like how you can win so that you feel like you're winning more and you can create momentum and consistency. That's how momentum is built. If you're trying to be perfect every day, you're not going to create consistency and momentum and confidence and self-efficacy. But if you widen the window and you're like, the target's a little bit bigger, this is what I consider success for this day, then you can start to get that momentum that leads to results and better health and all those good outcomes. Yeah. And again, if you're trying to be perfect, you're never going to feel like you're winning. Yeah, totally. Because perfect doesn't really exist. Right. And I love the saying of like, if all you can give on a certain day is 30% and you give 30%, you gave your 100%. Mm-hmm. Or like that was your 100%. Literally on our kickoff call in our programs, we do this thing where I should just start doing it with real water cups. But like if you have seven, say there's seven days a week and you have a um, empty, like seven empty glasses in front of you, a lot of people think that consistency is filling the cup up full every day, right? But consistency is like one day has like 30%, the next day has like a drop, the next day has is full. One day it's like overflowing. Consistency is just you put something in the bucket that day. It can be a 1%, but it can't be zero. It has to be whatever you can put in that day. That's consistency. That's a streak, not like it's overflowing every day. Like you said, if we aim for that, we're just going to quit when we yeah. don't do it. Yeah. And the loop becomes, okay, I didn't give a hundred percent today. Then I'm failing. I'm horrible. I suck. Clearly I can't do this. And then the self-talk, it's so bad. And then the motivation is so low because you're judging yourself and that's not going to make you want to show up again. Right. And now you have this like story that's not even true that you hold yourself and now it's snowballing and just creates something you got to unravel later. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is like the perfect transition into our other topic that we want to dive into today, which is radical honesty. And before we even started recording, you told me that this is something that has been recently a big part of your own inner growth journey and something that has been helping you a lot. So before we dive into anything more tangible or tips, can you just share a little bit about how it became a part of your story recently and how you've been feeling? Yeah, I think this has been a realization in this season of my life. There's been multiple times in the last few years where I've been trying to figure out something and I've had advice from people I've kind of navigated things but the one thing that's come clear is if you just say the truth like what is the truth? Like, for example, if you're worried about talking to someone about something, you're like, oh, what do I tell them? I got to figure out a way to say this. It's like, well, I'm alone right now. What is the actual truth? If you actually just say it out loud, it's not that bad. Like, it's never that bad. It's actually quite good, probably much better than whatever you lie you're going to try to make up or like how to like soften it. Being connected closer to that truth and then having no interference with how do I rephrase this? How do I turn around? Just saying that, you know, you still are got to be conscientious of whatever the person's going through. It doesn't, it's not mean. It's just on honest like what is honestly true and when you start speaking that way to yourself and to others I think it just transforms everything I've seen it with my clients when you get honest with yourself about your habits your goals where you are now and how it's not getting you where you want to be things start changing like for real everything starts changing not just your health yes yes I think it's so easy to come up with excuses and to just be like oh this keeps happening and I don't know why and I am so frustrated but maybe you're not really taking taking a true honest look at your life and how you're contributing to certain things and maybe that means you need to reevaluate your goals and be like are they realistic goals is it a goal you actually want because if it's not something you want why do you keep chasing it and then not doing the thing or is it just a matter of like your beliefs about yourself and like is that what's getting in the way so I think just really taking a good look at life and what you want and if you're taking steps to get there is a really important thing Mm -hmm. and so if you feel comfortable sharing what are some of the benefits that you've felt since making this shift yeah and i'm gonna answer that another quick way to think of honesty is accountability and ownership or like personal responsibility yes i think it's a practice a really good example of how you can start to open this up is say you do set a goal right say it's like new year's you get all this like endorphins from setting goals because it feels like we're doing something we're just doing it in our head we're not actually doing it yet right but it feels good you're like oh i'm pumped up i'm Mm -hmm. like i did all this i wrote these goals down but nothing has changed yet So I think asking yourself, like almost being like a consultant to yourself and saying on a scale of one to 10, how confident am I that I could achieve this thing that I said I was going to do? It has to be an eight or higher to be true. If it's lower than eight, you scratch that off. Then what can you change that goal to where you get to the point where it's an eight or higher out of 10 that yes, you can be accountable for that. You can own that. You know, you can just be real with yourself. So I think there's there's a way to like open up that conversation and practice that so that it's faster and it gets to be just like, yes, I know I can do that. No, I can't do that. And you're really just dialed in on that. But in terms of my life, it's 
completely changed the way that I lead my team. We have about 14 people on our team, registered dietitians, coaches. We have full-time developer. We have full-time ops. And I'm just really honest now with people. Um, if there's something tough that we need to talk about, everything is just a conversation. I used to be worried like, oh, well, what if this happens? And how am I going to tell them this? Or how am I going to lead this group of people? It's, it's just a conversation that you have to have. And if you're honest with, okay, this is what I'm up against. I think that's leadership. That's self-leadership. That's helping other people lead themselves too. So I'd say it's transformed my business. It's helped my clients a lot because I've never pretended to have all the answers. But obviously, when you're leading a group of women, sometimes you want to have the answers. Sometimes you want to be able to like go out and be like, I have a solution. But real honesty and accountability is being like, I don't know. I actually don't know. And we're going to figure it out together or, you know, we're, I'm going to research it or I'm going to get an expert in here that, like I said, I'm not a hormone expert. I won't pretend to be one. I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. So I would, you know, want to bring someone in who could speak to that. As a coach, I'm more of a motivational interviewer. I'm really real about is their goal going to happen or not based on their current beliefs. I'm so honest about their timeline. I'll tell them straight up that ain't going to happen. Mm -hmm. Like it's not <laughs> going to happen. You're not going to lose 60 pounds in a month. Like let's really look at this and I'll break down the science and why and what is achievable and but look you can lose this in this timeline if we do these things these small changes honest in that way in terms of speaking a truth to a client I definitely don't ever say my own opinions it's more like interviewing them and asking them really honest questions that they start to realize oh I haven't asked myself that or I haven't I've been avoiding that and then it's a process right it's like over time change happens so if they're confronted with questions that are opening up their brain to things, eventually it gets in through the cracks and then you start to realize things. So it takes time. It's like a drip effect. Also, when you work with someone, they're absorbing your energy. So if they see you're honest and open and you're really real about stuff, like they'll start to look inward and adopt some of those or like mirror some of those qualities too. So I've seen it reflect back in that way too in my work. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's beautiful. And I think when it comes to radical honesty, something that a lot of people might be thinking about when they're hearing us talk about this is like, okay, I have this thought, I have these truths that I want to speak into my life, but I've been avoiding them because maybe I'm going to have to change a lot of things if I start being real with myself about this. Or maybe other people are just going to be like slightly shocked because I've been people pleasing this whole time and not speaking my truth. So how would you recommend to anyone listening to start navigating that? And how can you approach things as a conversation and learn to communicate your truth in a way that will be well received by whoever's on the other side i think it starts inside first and it's almost like they say like intuition is a whisper and fear is really loud and like jarring right so i try to separate thoughts by like it's the whisper that's usually the truth and how can you turn up the volume on the whisper and turn down the screaming and the fear-based stuff like that makes you want to take action right now and so like it's anxiety inducing it's like i gotta do something. So it's kind of starting there, like what's loud, what's quiet, and which one is feeling more peaceful and more true. But that's why I said I think it's a practice because I don't think it happens overnight. I think it takes time and journaling and meditating and talking with really trusted friends and family can help facilitate some of that therapy obviously are just some of the tools I think yeah I don't think it's one size fits all and it's not just being like okay this is my truth everyone needs to understand it I'm just gonna go and like yell it out into the world as you said it's more about the intuition it's more about that like tiny little voice that's giving you hints and it's calming to be mm -hmm. like oh that's actually how I feel like leaning into that peace leaning mm -hmm. into that feeling yeah 100 now specifically when it comes to radical honesty how do you think that it ties into our original topic which was creating a better relationship with food and understanding your body and your fullness levels and just creating that more like loving approach in that area of life I think it can be to make it feel safe I think it has to start internal with just taking a look at what are your current belief systems, what are your current habits, and just becoming reflective of them. So I'll have my clients write down a list of things that create anxiety around food or their body thoughts, like a brain dump, like thoughts, situations, scenarios, comments, whatever it is, just what is there, like an audit, if you will. And starting to look at not just the negative stuff but also what makes you feel good what times do you have good feelings around food or your body image or you feel strong so I think it's like an inventory honesty is just being comfortable knowing yourself it's just being comfortable knowing things when you're not honest you live in the ignorance and it's uh, it's almost like safer because you're like well I don't have to deal with that so I'll just I just tuck it in a corner I don't have to really think about it but then it's affecting how you feel all the time on the background so it's kind of just i think taking an audit like i said and switching that frame of mind from like ignorance is bliss to like knowledge is power mm-hmm 
That's hard, but as you said, it's a practice. And I really like what you said about writing things out, like everything that comes up when it comes to your body and with food. And I know a lot of people are afraid of journaling because they're afraid that if they write something down, it will become true or they'll like manifest that. But it's like, it's still living in your subconscious. Like it's still living in your brain, even if you're not like putting it on paper. And that's like fear talking because it's loud and it's like, don't do that. But what's the worst that could happen by writing it down? You release it. Like, like literally there's no con <laughs> literally you can throw it your away. hand hurt your hand might hurt a little right. bit i like to think like what's the worst case scenario what's the best case scenario and what's the most likely scenario because usually we're focused on the worst and it's gonna be either best or most likely and they're never that bad it's mm-hmm. like when you're not being completely honest with yourself or making the most informed choices or educated choices which you can make when you're looking straight into the situation and looking straight into the facts if you're not doing that You might be making decisions that cause you to abandon yourself in the moment because you're ignoring the truth. You're ignoring what your intuition is speaking. You're ignoring how you feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think another piece of this is that you might not be ready to do that. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. You might not be ready to do it. Like I'll work with clients for a year and I'm just like, we'll do other things. We'll work out. We'll get some healthy habits in place. But like they might not want to look there yet and they will eventually. But it's like you have to do it also on your own timeline. And when you feel ready for it, kind of. Yeah, I think that applies to everything. Yeah, especially in the sense of like, let's say you're friends of someone or a parent or a partner or something. And you can see so clearly from the outside that there's like something that if they change, they would feel so much better or they would be so much happier. But they're only going to do it once it becomes very clear to them. Them that they need to do it and i'll give a personal example recently that doesn't have to do with food but has to do with wellness i haven't talked about this in the podcast i don't think but i have something called vasovagal syndrome which basically means that i faint and just pass out out of nowhere if there are certain triggers that get activated so if i'm like overheating or dehydrated or overstimulated or from having blood sugar issues like my body would just give out and in the last like four months this has happened two times and it just over the last month has been something that i had to get so real with myself about i'm so overstimulated like i need to manage my stress and unfortunately it had to get to the point of me fainting like two times in four months to be like okay clearly my body is asking me to slow down clearly i am doing too much even though i knew consciously that the this was happening even though i did feel stressed out or clearly saw the impacts it was having on my physical health it had to come down to a personal realization and like a motivation to change and it came through the radical honesty of being like okay this is a situation and what am i doing to contribute to this yeah that's so real it's like the book the body keeps a score he was trying to tell you something exactly and the body's still keeping score even yeah. if you're not <laughs> exactly that's that's it that's the best way to put it honestly is it's being kept whether you want to look at it or not so you get to make make that decision ultimately for sure and i think on the topic also of radical honesty something that applies in this scenario of carrying conversations with people and not with yourself like radical honesty in your relationships something that has helped me a lot is just understanding how to improve your communication skills because i took a training in college that was an active listening training session and through active listening you can obviously learn how to be a better listener and how to hold space better for people to talk to you and open up to you and feel safe enough to share certain things like being mindful of your body language or not cutting people off or not immediately jumping to advice and things like that but i think there are also really important skills when it comes to expressing yourself like using i statements like i feel x way when we fall into this pattern of doing y things or just trying to calm your nervous system down before having a conversation or just understanding how you usually express things when you're emotional like i know myself and i know that if i'm in the heat of the moment i'm probably not going to say the most wise thing or even the truest thing because i'm just caught up in my emotions so i know that for me i have to take a step back i have to like think take a shower go for a walk something journal so that i can get clear on what is it that i'm feeling or why did i get upset or why do i feel anxious and i think it would be so beneficial if more people knew these things too but i'm curious to know if you have certain things that you think have made you a better communicator too yeah that's a great example of accountability and how it shows up in relationships with others something that i was going to mention too with relationships with food and then family or belief systems oftentimes the work will involve conversations with family members because we dine with them we eat with them we see them on holidays so i often facilitate or help encourage clients who you know pretend depending on the situation to start having those conversations and to your point it's always an i conversation it's 
I'm working on these things in my life and my relationship with food and here's what I would like to change. Not like attacking, right? Like you put this belief on me or you made me feel this way about food or you made me hate my body, but it's like, it's the accountability and then leading that way, like having that leadership in conversations with people you love or people you spend time with um, and asking them if they'll support you in your journey towards working on this thing. And I think that's one way I definitely... I've had lots of conversations with clients about that. I've had conversations with my family about those things. And that's also a really important part of like honesty and how it pertains to your like relationship with your health because it's impacted by the people around you and vice versa too. Yeah. And I think a lot of the times, maybe even a signpost of are you being honest or not is falling to a victim mindset or falling to blaming, being like, you always say this. And because of that, I am always feeling this when I'm around you and using these like extreme words, like always or never, and just pointing the finger at other people instead of, taking a step back and being like okay clearly i'm feeling a little bit dysregulated in this situation why do i think that is is it because i'm getting triggered by x thing and realizing that you can't really change people that much so the best thing you can do is just be really honest about what you need and how mm-hmm. they can support you even if you're not directly saying like oh you are making me feel this this that it's just being like i'm working on this and i would really appreciate if you would support me and i would love to explain to you different ways you could do that if you're open to it or right. something like that yeah like getting like their way in to buy in to your plan sort of or your your needs yeah yeah exactly and just to close the topic of radical honesty you dove into it a little bit and how it's impacted like your business and how you've talked in more honest ways with like the people you work with and learning that it can all just be a conversation i'm curious to know if there's anything else on the topic that you would want to share or like ways it's impacted you in your own personal life whether it's like your more personal relationships or your own relationship with food or your own fitness goals yeah i think it impacts dating for sure just When you have confidence about your truth and you start to speak it, it's not like you have to always lead with it, but it should come out like on the, on its right timing, but it's definitely impacted dating and more fulfilling relationships. Um, Specifically, I already mentioned kind of business, but just those relationships of like, there's so much less anxiety in my life because I just know that the truth is going to be the best way forward every time there's just a lot less anxiety in life if you just know that you're going to lead with your truth you'll figure it out you'll find the words they'll come to you and no one is ever going to blame you if like you're really genuine and authentic in that so I know that's not like a direct example but I can go into an uncertain situation because I'm like I know what I feel about this and I'll say it yeah yeah I also think it's really important to remember because a lot of people are always thinking or asking like how can I be more authentic how can I be more of myself and just being honest and being real was probably like the best way because a lot of the times we are disconnecting ourselves from our true authentic selves because we're trying to portray a narrative or be perfect or paint a portrait of being a certain way when that's not really who we are I saw this post on TikTok of this girl getting ready to go out to a bar and she was like me telling myself I have to get myself done up to go to the bar because how else would I meet my husband and then I saw someone in the comment section being like if you don't even like going to a bar why do you think you would find your husband at one good question (laughs) That's a really good one. Right? And I feel like we do that in like so many areas of life where we like think we're supposed to be doing certain things to get a certain result, but maybe that's not what we should be doing at all because that's not our truth. That's not what we like or that's Mm -hmm. not what's authentic to us. And when you stay more authentic, you're able to draw in more authentic and important things into your life that you'll resonate with more, whether it's people, goals, results, situations, opportunities, things like that. Amen. Yeah. Just dissolves fear. It just dissolves it because like if you're just being yourself, like you always know what to do if you're trying to be someone else that's when you get stuck in situations where you're like you don't feel like you're enough you don't know how to act it's because you're not being yourself like if you're just being yourself you'll know how to act you'll know what to do you know how to dance you're in your own weird way whatever like there's really not many like scary situations if you're just going into it like that's just I'm just gonna be me you know it's it's so much easier I don't know why it's like so hard to be ourselves because it is actually so much easier in the end and I think what you were saying before about there not being any shoulds ties into this yeah because when we think there's a way you should dress a way you should talk a way you should show up on social media a way you should look Mm -hmm. that's where the disconnect comes from instead of asking yourself what do i want what do i want to feel like what do i feel drawn to naturally which is why even with like podcast episodes or like content that I make I always try to ask myself like how can I be the least scripted possible like how can I just be the most like flowy 
with this and I think that applies to everything yeah yeah I love this and I think we touched on so many valuable mindset shifts and little tools that anyone listening can implement into their lives to manage their relationship with themselves and just cultivate more honesty cultivate more love when it comes to their relationship with food or their real life relationships so thank you so much for all of that and let's do some rapid fire questions to close everything out we already did these last time but let's see how your answers have changed over the span of like a year or so (laughs) so first question is what does inner growth mean to you? I think it just means being a student of life and I think it all starts inside. Like it's inside out, everything in life. So like anything you want, even if it's an external thing, is going to start internally somehow with a thought before it becomes an action. So I'd say I think of it that way. It's like inner growth. It's, It's all starting with you and it comes out. And you touched on it so many times throughout the episode when we were talking about like your relationship with food or being honest. You were like, it starts within. Like you have to look inside. You have to journal it out. You have to talk it out. You have to understand what's going on in your head and your heart before it can like be a real life tangible Mm -hmm. result or situation. So I resonate with that a lot personally too. Do you have any (laughs) books that you'd recommend to anyone listening? Oh God, this is so embarrassing. Does it have to be related? No. Okay. I just stopped reading any useful books the last year. I got burnt out. I was reading like business books and health books and I got so burnt out and I started reading for fun and um this is so embarrassing but I started reading the Akatar series oh god wait same yes I finished it already I'm on the last book I need like book recs after this but it just was great it helped me just like have fun (laughs) yeah you know the same thing happened to me actually I like listening to like podcasts a lot for self-improvement but recently I haven't been reading a lot of self-help books and definitely have been loving like fantasy and like romance books and I feel like it's so nice to just like disconnect from the world a little bit so fun not everything has to be so serious yeah exactly and what makes you feel like your best highest self honestly honesty (laughs) I don't know I think right now the season I'm in is just like I feel so strong and powerful when I act on like my gut feelings and doing it with conviction knowing that I might not get it right but I'd rather act on my conviction and my gut and get it wrong and then learn from it and admit it and be accountable than like go try to do something that doesn't feel like me or isn't what I want to be doing or feels uncomfortable. So yeah, I feel really strong and powerful lately when I like lead in that way and show up in that way in interactions and like conversations, stuff with myself and get like really ahead of the game. Like I don't wait on anything. If I feel something now, I'm like, I'm going to act on this. I am 32 and me in my thirties is very like convicted about, okay, I felt this. I don't need to second guess it. I don't need to like see if it comes true. I'm just going to act on this. And I feel really good and strong when I do that. That's like you and your Aries power. It so is. (laughs) It really is. It's a fire energy. (laughs) Yes. I love that. I'm not trying to like tamp, damper the the fire anymore, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. I really appreciate that. (laughs) And yeah, I just think life gets so much better when you're not living in your own lies. Mm -hmm. Right. And if someone didn't hear anything from this episode, what would you want to leave them with? (laughs) That's not this. I know. (laughs) Read (laughs) Akatar. Go get into fantasy books. That's it. Um, I would just say maybe practice getting in tune with the little like whispers. I think also as women, this is really important. Uh, I wish I had a mentor in my early 20s who told me to listen to my intuition more and act like just go for it. But it can inform all other decisions in your life and impact your health. So yeah, just being truthful with your your quiet whispering voice. Yeah. And I think something I'm taking away too is that it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to say maybe, and then just give yourself a little bit more time to answer or someone it's okay to say hey can I get back to you next week hey can I get back to you in 24 hours not everything has to be like an immediate answer and sometimes you just need that extra little bit of time just so you can hear the whisper yeah instead of hearing that like oh I have to say it now like uh and then you say something that's not necessarily true yeah love that Thank you so much for coming on the show. This was so fun. Welcome to Austin. Thank you. I'm loving Austin. I'm so happy to be here. And can you plug yourself and tell everyone listening where they can find you, work with you, learn more about Petite Power? Sure. You can find me at April V. Whitney on YouTube. That's where 
most of us hang out and Instagram and at petitepower.com. Congrats on 100K, by the way. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> YouTube queen. You know, it was because of you that I started YouTube. No. Really? Yes. You were like, I think you'd be so good at it. Well, yeah, you, you are like a natural <laughs> for video. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. And if you guys are watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit subscribe. If you are listening to this and not watching it, head over to YouTube and hit subscribe and give this episode a like. Let us know in the comments what you took away from it. I appreciate all of you for for tuning in i hope you remember to water yourself take care of yourself and remember that you are always growing no matter where you're at in your journey and i will see you guys next week